Hello, so thank you for attending my talk. My name is Ahmed Fatoum. I am Embedded Linux Developer with Pingotronics. And I'm going to tell you a bit about some past projects where I implemented support for having a single image for different hardware variants. So embedded systems can look, uh, yeah, can, be, can vary a lot in their looks. If everyone asks their neighbor how their current project look like, you will probably yeah, see something like that. But in the course of a single project, you have a lot less variation. So often you have like a product family where you have more IOs, other connectivity, uh, maybe a bit of RAM, a, um, a more powerful processor, but basically they are the same. And so when adding support for such hardware variants, the question is, yeah, sh can we reuse the same image that we have or should we treat it as completely different hardware? And yeah, hardware variants can be new products as described. It can also be that um, they were accounted for in advance. So you can have the same PCB, but some parts are not fitted. So are marked do not place the components on the PCB. And the hardware uh, developer think about some way to query the hardware and ask it what kind of hardware you are to allow for a single image. And even if when doing the first product, no one is thinking about doing a follow-up, it nearly always happens because you need to switch out some chip or you need to strip down to save costs. And then you have a number of devices where you have images for and then you have new devices and you are uh, faced with the decision, do I still need to support the old devices? And yeah. So these are the two alternatives you have. We could have uh, multiple images, uh, one image per hardware variant. Uh, that's often done because all differences are contained in the build system. So what? Um, so if this uh, hardware doesn't need uh, graphic support, you can just disable graphic support. You don't need uh, even need to make it a module or something. Just disable it. So you can get the size uh, down quite a bit. And you can tune very specifically to your used CPU. So even within CPUs that are supposed to be uh, very similar to each other, like um, uh, Atma Microchip, some are 5D3 and some are 5D4, they are practically the same CPU, but one has Neon and one doesn't. So if you wanted to uh, run the same root file system on both, you would have, you will likely decide to disable Neon. And that would be quite a performance impact for the other platform that has Neon. Uh, and so you would opt for multiple images in many cases. And because you can do changes fine-grained for just one platform, you can avoid breaking the other existing platform because your changes, like the file you add or the configuration you change, you can make it just for the single board. On the other hand, a single image is faster to build because you don't need to vary configuration for each uh, hardware you want to support. You have less bit rot of shared code because you are building the other platform all the time. And because you get an artifact that boots on all systems, you can more easily integrate it with your CI. So you are testing for a given platform, but you can take the same artifact, hand it over to your CI or your CI builds it, and then it can deploy it on all the variants. And that's a lot less development friction than having to juggle images around. And that shows also in the user experience, which is much improved because you have just a single image to flash in the factory. You need not to account for hardware variation. Uh, a technician who goes into the field and needs to recover a system doesn't have to juggle around multiple USB sticks or multiple SD cards. And you don't need to document uh, some pesky pitfalls, like you need to read the sticker and check what RAM you have, then you need to take the correct bootloader because you just have one bootloader that works on all your devices optimally. Uh, these two parts are a bit strange. They seem like they would be in conflict, but it depends on how your development uh, is structured. So if it's a single team that is maintaining a product family, uh, that's a good reason to go with single image because you want to run the same software on all of these devices. And if you break something, you want to know it very early on. But if it's different, uh, uh, different teams for the different products, then maybe go with multiple images so you can opt in to take the changes. You can still share code in open embedded that would be a shared layer for bot specific stuff or for the update infrastructure, but you could do this at your own pace 
can pull in the changes and if you have a stabilization step, then don't get, take the changes now. And yeah, that's my only uh, remaining slide about multiple images. Then I will talk about single images. Uh, so the usual way for multiple images is that you have a separate open embedded slash Yocto machine. And you usually take the existing machine, you change it up a bit, maybe change the tune parameters because you have another CPU, you change the uh, bootloader configuration that you use, you change which device tree you are using. And uh, across the BSP, you pepper around these overrides. So this, uh, on that platform, you need that uh, extra package configuration. So you add a line in the BB append and say, add this extra dependency. Or you need to install one more UDEV rule. So you say at that other place, yeah, install that extra file. And yeah, so that's how it looks like uh, with multiple images. Single images are quite different to that. You have shared code, but you dynamically reconfigure at runtime. And that works for most software we already use. They can read in some configuration format and can adapt themselves, maybe not at runtime, but at startup. So what we need to do is to vary this configuration at startup, but per hardware. Not use a static configuration that's set in the build system, but check out what hardware it is, use a different configuration. Uh, just so we are, uh, are all on the same page, single image per hardware doesn't mean a single image for all functions. So if you have like a spy flash and that spy flash is used for recovery and it needs to be a very small image. So in that case, yeah, use a single image for the recovery stuff. You don't need to try to force your main image to be that small. But uh, as a rule of thumb, you want in a single build to be able to build all artifacts all update bundles, all disk images, or recovery images for a given platform. Because if you don't do that, it starts to bit rot. And yeah, that's what I mean with single image. For a single function, like a disk image, you have just one image for all the hardware that you want to support. And you don't need to do that via hardware configuration or local ink include files or something like that. In the rest of the talk, I will introduce a toolbox that I have used in uh, preceding projects to achieve a single image. And yeah, to give it some order, I will do it in the order that the system boots. And if you have any questions or alternative suggestions, just interrupt me or raise your hand and yeah, can talk about that. So let's start. Uh, in the beginning was the kernel. So the kernel is supposed to be our hardware abstraction layer. So it's natural that the kernel should know about the hardware. We can build a single kernel image for a platform like um, ARM64. But uh, the problem is once you try to support all the devices because no two uh, ARM64 um, SOCs look alike. Uh, traditionally, you had like innumerable buses like USB and PCI where you can just ask the hardware, what kind of devices do you have? Then you get back, yeah, this vendor ID, this product ID, you match the drivers against that. But with modern system on chips, you usually don't have that. Most peripherals are not enumerable. So you have hardware description. So what the kernel does is at runtime, at boot time, it gets some kind of hardware description, be it ACPI or device tree. And then it loads, the, after loading the drivers, it matches the drivers against its devices. So what we need to support multiple hardware variants is to vary that device tree. Uh, I will not talk about ACPI in this talk. So device tree is for me open firmware device trees, which is a simple structure of nodes, and these nodes have properties. Uh, the most important pr uh, property for now is a compatible property, which describes what kind of devices it is, or what driver I need to load, what should the driver be compatible with to be able to work with that device. And there is a top level compatible that describes what hardware I have, what board I have in front of me. Um, you might be inclined to think, and some people even do that, that why not chip the device tree pre-flashed? So the device tree describes a board. I am shipping you a board. Why not just hard code the device tree that describes that board? After all, I designed the board. I know how the device tree looks like. And we had even uh, customers that tried to argue that. Uh, yeah, one step removed from that is just use the bootloader's device tree. Some um, uh, a lot of people uh, are doing that as well. The problem with that is that our understanding of the hardware evolves. 
maybe it doesn't evolve for the board as much, but it evolves for the system on chip, certainly, because people are reverse engineering stuff, are looking more in depth into stuff. They want to do stuff like better power management, and so the device tree is extended after uh, understanding the chip better. But if you just have that old device tree in your bootloader, then yeah, that's not evolving. So what you really want is to use a device tree that's shipped with the kernel and have the bootloader only select the correct device tree. And it can do that via this compatible. So different hardware boards would have different compatibles. The bootloader had, would have some intrinsic knowledge about what is the board that I am running on and then it would choose the correct device tree for that board. Uh, thankfully, there are a lot of uh, different standards that you could uh, use for that. There is a bootloader specification, uh, first added for Gummy Boot, now System D Boot on Fedora. Uh, their grub has a lot of patches, including support for bootloader specification, and Bearbox also implements the bootloader specification. So that's basically on the boot medium, a directory where you can put your, uh, your boot files and you would reference what kernel you have, what device tree you have, what device tree overlays you have, what boot arguments you should use. And the bootloader would compare all, uh, would uh, read in all these files and then choose the correct um, boot file. Uh, U-Boot has something similar with Distribute. It references the bootloader specification but doesn't really adhere to it. But it does the same thing, basically. There is also fit where you can also have a single format where you put everything in and you can do a lookup of your configuration. There are unified kernel images. But in the end, there are all ways to ship together with your kernel, not only the init ID, but also all device trees that you want to support. Uh, if you go with fit, be, uh, you need to be a bit on the lookout because um, open embedded uh, course kernel fit image BB class is a bit peculiar. It's by it's very much for using a kernel, one kernel. It's not easy to extend, and it has uh, some quirks like you must hard code load and entry addresses. You don't want to do that because your platforms might not have RAM at the same location because the load address is just a physical address where you place your kernel, and you shouldn't need to hard code that, but it does that by default. And it also uh, uses configuration names, which are not really stable, as we will see, uh, and you rather want to use device tree compatibles. So when I upload my slides, you see these uh, small arrow things like on Wikipedia that has links here, for example, to the patch sets that add support to EE Core's uh, kernel fit image BB class for this feature. Yeah, so back to the bootloader. The bootloader needs to figure out what hardware it's running on. That's a bigger topic. I will keep that to the end and see if I have time. But for now, we will just assume that the bootloader is outside our main storage area. It's a bit of cheating to redefine our image to not contain the bootloader, so we just wave that away. But fortunately, that's becoming increasingly common because you have these EMMC, you have EMMCs instead of NAND flash, and you can use with many boot ROMs these dedicated hardware boot partitions to place your bootloader, and then you can have a completely portable image on the main area of the EMMC. And then the only thing you need to do is to ship different bootloaders that are pre-installed on the hardware. We will look later about how to update these different bootloaders. But for the main image, it's the same, just the bootloader changes. Um, Bearbox has native support for something it calls multi-images. So in one build, it can just take the same Bearbox binary, prefix it with a small loader that has a different device tree, and then you can have like IMX 32-bit configs that builds you 120 different bootloaders in one go, and you can just cherry pick the ones you need or just disable the ones you don't need. Uh, TFA, I implemented something similar for STM32 MP15 because it also probes completely from device tree, so you can do that there too. Uh, with U-Boot, it's a really uphill battle because of the love for if dev and weak functions, so you will probably not want to use uh, to do that in U-Boot, but you can use uh, Yocto support for that. So Yocto has this U-Boot config uh, magic variable that will let you build U-Boot multiple times in different build directories and then collect the artifacts and install them all into one directory, and that way you can just create in the same build multiple U-Boot binaries. Something we have uh, also is Yocto multiconfig. 
uh, that was talked about a bit uh, yesterday. With that, you can mix different machines in the same build. So you could do a machine that's just the same, but customizes your um, your boots recipes. But yeah, that's really overkill for that use case, and you run into uh, many um, corner cases when you use uh, exactly the same machine, uh, exactly the same CPU. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't advise doing that. So you have better options. Uh, once uh, bootloader has chosen a device tree, it applies fix-ups. That's normal. Uh, the standard fix-ups are like uh, boot arguments, which are all also located in the device tree, and um, the init RD, the init RAMFS, where, it's, where it was loaded. So the bootloader all, always does some fix-ups. So it's not much work to just say, yeah, let's add some more fix-ups on top. Uh, other stuff it usually does uh, is a MAC address or the size of the memory that it has detected. And where it gets, in uh, where it gets interesting are bot-specific and architecture-specific fix-ups. So for example, if I have one of two different uh, panels, and these panels are not runtime detectable, and they need different timings. So Linux has driver, a driver for that, but I need to tell it what panel do I have. So I could just have uh, a simple fix-up that after checking what panel I have by reading an EEPROM or something, it just rewrites the compatible. So here is an example how to do it on the Bearbox shell. And you have a nice OF diff command. So if you do that stuff, the OF diff command gives you a diff when you apply fix up how it does it look like before and after, which is very useful with, uh, with that stuff. Then you can have also do this, you can do the same also in C. So here is practically the same in C. In U-Boot, you can do that too, but you don't work on an um, fl you don't work on the unflattened device tree, but on the flattened one. So that means you must uh, watch out that you don't um, run out of memory, because if you have like a status OK and you want to sh change it to status disabled, you need more bytes. But it's a flat structure. You can't uh, just in place extend something. You will need to call something like FTT increase size to reallocate the uh, FTT, make it a bit bigger, write your stuff, and then yeah, pass that to the kernel. While in bearbox device trees are always what you would nowadays calls live tree and what they are switching to. But I think for fix up, you still don't have live trees. It's still just a flattened device tree. Here is a U-boot example for uh, disabling some nodes. So uh, most of you already use fix-ups, even if not in board code, because architecture code has a lot of it. So if you have any modern SOC, you will have like 10 different variants from it. Maybe you don't have an NPU. Maybe you don't have VPUs. Maybe you have uh, less uh, CPU cores. And what usually happens in architecture code is that they check the fuse box, and depending on that, they patch the device tree. So Linux does not need to care and doesn't need to carry different device trees for the different hardware variants. And a mistake that's unfortunately uh, very often done is to hard code these device tree node names. Because these device tree node names, no one guarantees their stability. They keep changing all the time. So that's, for example, here an example from uh, upstream U-boot, where it hard codes device tree passes from the downstream kernel. So it wouldn't help you at all with the upstream kernel. And even if you added the device tree passes from the upstream kernel, it wouldn't be stable anyway, because no one guarantees that these names stable. And it's a difficult problem. How do you fix something up that you don't now uh, don't know for sure how it looks like. Uh, the way I do it usually is, if there is an alias, that's the best thing, just take the alias uh, out of the device tree and look up with it, or search with the compatible, that's a bit slower because you need to iterate over the whole device tree, but when you find the node with the compatible, you are sure that that is the correct one. And in Barbox there is an OF git node by reproducible name, and a reproducible name is uh, path for a device tree node that doesn't factor in the names of the nodes, but just the hierarchy and the rec properties. And that way, you can do a lookup on Bearbox's own device tree to find out where is the node located, and then take that reproducible name and search for it in the kernel device tree. And that's the way that stuff like um, 
uh, SKU handling is done in Bearbox. So instead of hard coding, where is the uh, VPU located, it just, you have in the device tree a pointer at it in the device tree, and then it tries to find for the reproducible name, the counterpart on the other side. So there's also device tree overlays, which are just a special case of device tree fix-ups, but they are not written in C or in shell, they are written in device tree. And yeah, some uh, um, ecosystems use this a lot, like the Raspberry Pi, and they extend on it a lot, uh, like really a lot. They have a, a lot of extensions there, so you can't use these device tree overlays with U-Boot or with Bearbox out of the box, or even with the official tools. But they can be useful if you just stick to the standardized part, if you have true plug-and-play components. Like here you have an RTC module. If your system designer has some expansion port and you can just insert a board, and maybe you have multiple ins uh, such expansion ports and all look a bit, uh, and you can have like a lot of different configurations. In that case, device tree overlays make a lot of sense. So yeah, but under the hood, they are exactly the same as a fix up. They take the kernel device tree, it's applied onto it. They can't delete nodes, that's something fix ups can do, but often you can just change the status property. And uh, the different BL spec, distroboot, and fit, they have um, a way to apply device tree fix ups. So you could just chip your kernel with the device tree, with the device tree fix up, and at runtime, let your bootloader decide what to apply, which uh, overlay to apply, and do that. You can also uh, take patches to uh, do DT overlays in Linux. I wouldn't recommend it because you need to patch your kernel. And these patches have been around for a lot of years. And I don't know if they ever will be merged. They exist in a very weird limbo state where you have support for patching the kernel device tree, but you have no way to do it without writing your own kernel code. And yeah, just let the user. Uh, the um, bootloader handle it. Often it's even faster because you don't need to hold the uh, OF mutex. For example, if you flash an FPGA, that holds all device tree uh, probing. No nothing can happen until you have flashed the FPGA. Uh, yeah, you can still flash an FPGA in the kernel, just don't use this patch set, just create your own module or something. Yeah, that's all what I wanted to talk about uh, in the bootloader so far. Uh, and now to the kernel. So we are building embedded systems. So we have a lot of uh, applications that interact directly with the hardware, of course, uh, over the kernel most often, but they really hard code some stuff that's specific to the kernel. And they do that with file path. So here is an example. You want to read the fuse box to check, for example, if you are secure booted or to just write the fuses to enable secure boot. If you use the direct file path, it has these SOC bus and uh, addresses in it, and these are not in any way uh, guaranteed to stay the same. So these have changed in the past multiple times, so you don't really want to hard code that, because it's not even the same for one given SOC. And you don't, uh, and over different SOCs, you, yeah, it won't, uh, it's not portable. What you can instead do are uh, use the nice symlinks that SysFS all already has for you. So the all NVMEM devices are on a bus. Yeah, NVMEM is not really a bus, it's more a class, but there is an NVMEM bus, it has devices on it, and you can do a lookup for IMX or COD0, for example. That way you can support multiple kinds of uh, IMX fuse boxes without having to hard code where it is located exactly. And for the cases where you don't have symlinks, use UDEV and create a symlink and vary your UDEV rules according to the platform that you have. And that really makes you more robust across kernel updates. So all the UDEV stuff I am showing here, I actually did that to get from a vendor kernel to mainline kernel because everything changes and it's much easier to have like a middle ground or an intermediary step where you can run both the old and the new kernel with the same root FS and then you just have a migration for the kernel instead of having, yeah, we need all this for the vendor kernel, all this for the user space, switch all at once. That's a bit much. Uh, yeah, device paths are also a problem, uh, especially for block devices, because it's a bit tricky. You already have this persistent storage rules that are there by default in UDEV, but you don't want to use any of them, actually, because they don't play nicely with 
like an AB system where you have this can have the exact same partition twice. That means the same uh, file system slash partition in your ID. And yeah, when you have that, that sucks a bit because you are not guaranteed which one the symlink will point at. It just takes the last processed one. And what I have found that customers like to do too and not tell you about it is to flash the same image on SD card and on eMMC and then wonder why stuff behaves strangely because the code just assumed I will have exactly one partition with that label. Now you have two partitions with that label or two partitions with that UUID. So what you want to instead to do is write your own UDEF rules and do stuff like identify devices by usage or stable topology. Here is an example that factor in, factors in not only the name of the partition, but also the device name. Uh, that's submitted to systemd actually. I hope it goes in soon. And then you have a standard way of just referencing a partition that's, that works even if someone ins uh, inserts an SD card with exactly the same image as an eMMC. Uh, another thing is uh, that was slash dev. There is also slash sys symlinks. We have seen that some of them are created automatically, but uh, often we want to access, for example, an EEPROM. And that EEPROM can be on different I2C controllers on different devices, but we want in the software to reference it. And I found the device tree aliases to be very useful for that. So the kernel will set an environment variable, OF alias, and the index. Uh, if you have an alias in the device tree, and you can easily just create for all aliases, just create symlinks into CSFS, and then write code with that. And you can do something like def by OF alias, EEPROM 0 slash nvmem, and then you have a stable path to get your EEPROM, and don't have like to write your own UDEF rule or hard code a lot of stuff. And as last resort, you can also match by compatible in UDEF. You need a UDEF helper, I think is the name. I'm not sure. But you need to run your own script to create an OF base compatible variable and use that to uh, do a check in UDEF. It's not as easy as with OF alias. Here is an example. And that's like last resort. If you don't have anything else to differentiate your bots, you can fall back to the compatible. And with all that, you can customize your systemd units. So you can do condition path exists. If, for example, I have a coprocessor which I created a link for, then I could run some service that's specific to that coprocessor, and I can do that, and I can have this unit always, and it just won't be activated if I don't need it. There is also condition firmware where you can match the device tree compatible, and but you don't really want to use that. You want to use the stuff that you did with UDEF, but one good uh, use case for condition firmware is if you need to do stuff very early because you want to provide a boot splash very early and you want to mount this, uh, this directory before UDEF has run. And in that case, yeah, I know that MMC block 0 P4 is stable and I want to use it. Yeah, so you can just match the device tree compatible and not, don't involve UDEF at all. So this dev link will be created by devtempfs for you and you don't need to worry about UDEF. Uh, yeah, last thing, use well-known target names. So you have boot complete if you have like an FPGA that you want to check if it comes up correctly and fails the boot otherwise. Yeah, just do required by boot complete and order your stuff, stuff behind boot complete. Don't just hard code. I want to check that the FPGA has come up. Or I have Western, it's part of the graphical target. Do a wanted by graphical target and order it before the graphical target. And don't keep hard coding whether you have Western or if you have Western in a uh, some specific configuration, just use the well-known targets you have or, or add your own ones. And yeah, you can do the same thing in System Network D. There, you probably always want to use device recompatibles because it's not so easy to detect what you have. So if I have Acme Best Switch, then I can configure my VLANs on that way. Yeah, um, yeah. last but not least, runtime configuration. Yeah, so I need, don't need not tell much about that. You can have like an exec start pre that writes a dynamic configuration. Uh, a lot of variables use, uh, a lot of uh, programs use stuff like xdg uh, config home to find out where the, uh, where the configuration is, or they automatically look first in slash run. Uh, systemd uh, does that, for example. And then you can just do stuff dynamically into slash run, uh, read some template, change some stuff, and yeah, and then you can 
handle multiple variants easily. Yeah. Back to the bootloader. I avoided that by saying, yeah, just use different bootloader images, but, at the, uh, but you can do that in the factory, but at the update step, it's a bit more complicated because you want to choose the correct bootloader for the board that you are running on. Uh, fortunately, it's quite easy in RAUC, so there is this variant support. You can have a variant file, which you point at a file that describes what board you have, and you can even point it into SysFS. So you point it into SysFS, and this file would say, I am an IMX 8M Mini, I am an IMX 8M Nano, and then when building your bundle, you can have a fallback bootloader, a bootloader that's always used, and a bootloader that's only used for the IMX 8M Nano. And then you can build it, and you get a RAUC bundle that you can update. You see it has two slots for a fit image and for a rootfs, but it has two alternative slots. One is a bootloader for IMX 8MM, and one is a bootloader for IMX 8MN. And yeah, that's that's quite easy way to have like the same update bundle for uh, different platforms, coupled with stuff like um, adaptive update, uh, Rauk calls it. You can just remote mount your bundle and download over HTTPS, and you wouldn't need to download the stuff that you don't need. You just mount the Verity image and just download the stuff you don't need, and yeah, you wouldn't even have to download other bootloaders if you just use that. Yeah, uh, I have two slides about using a single bootloader. I think I have a bit, yeah, I have enough time for that. So why would you use an, a single bootloader when you can have a RAUC just or any other update system just install the correct bootloader for you? It makes stuff easier. So you can have an easier factory bootstrap if you have different variants of the chips. You don't need to have different bootloaders for it. Yeah, as talked about, you, sometimes you don't want to assume anything on the system you are going to recover is working, so even the bootloader uh, might be broken, and in that case, you want a bootloader on your USB stick or SD recovery, um, um, or, or recovery SD. Uh, it's a smaller update bundle size. If you have a lot of different variants, you just need to ship one bootloader, because most of the code is shared anyway. So. Yeah, so the so whole boot code and common code, it's the same. You just have like a different hardware description. The same thing with Linux. You don't ship different kernels. You just ship one kernel to change some stuff to be modules, and then you dynamically uh, adapt. And it avoids confusion a lot. So I had multiple instances where uh, someone uses a wrong image, or I use a wrong image because you have an image that can boot from QSBI, you have another image that boots from MMC, you have this variant, you have this uh, RAM configuration, and yeah, you can just avoid that. And for that, you want your bootloader to support multiple boards. Uh, the easy way out is if these are completely different socks. So, for example, an IMX28 boots from an MBR partition, and an IMX6 boots from a fixed location on the SD or MMC card. So, what you would do is just create an image with a boot partition for that bootloader, and at a fixed offset that other bootloader, and they both can use the same root file system and go on from there. So, that's no problem. But the problem comes when you have similar enough SOCs that the boot ROM will look at the same location for a, uh, for a bootloader, for a user bootloader, and start it. It's because in that case, you need the bootloader to be able to adapt. With U-Boot, that's mostly unfeasible, because you really build for a single SOC. You have all, all uh, around the U-Boot code. You have either ifdef or weak, where you check if I am an IMX8MN, do that. If an I IMX8MM, do that. You can't really have a, boot, uh, a new boot that works on both. While in Bearbox, because of this multi-image, as a side effect of this multi-image feature, it all changes are really contained in the pre-bootloader and the device tree, and everything probes from the device tree. So recently, uh, Arch Multi-Arch, which is a bit of a multi -no uh, misnomer, it should have call, been called Arch Multi-Platform maybe, was added to Bearbox, and in the same build you can build like RockChip, SDM32, uh, IMX, and so on. You can build a lot of uh, boards just in one go, and yeah, the, and you can define your near entry point where you check what stock I have, and then just go on and select um, the correct device tree. Uh, once you have that common pre-bootloader that starts, you will need to detect the bot type. 
read an EEPROM, probe I squared C devices. Probe I squared C devices is a very useful thing even if you don't have the same bootloader, but you want to support like a variant with a touch screen and another with another touch screen, or just detect do I have a display or not because displays are usually touch displays and they have an I squared C touch controller. So just probe if the I squared C touch controller at a given address answers. And if yes, you can just toggle enable all the display stuff and Linux doesn't need to know what the difference is. It just creates a device tree which either has a display pipeline or it doesn't. And yeah, at the end, uh, you set your own device tree compatible according to the detected board type, and then you can go f on from there as described before. Uh, but when you do that, uh, I, I saw some things like that with U-Boot and also with Sparebox, where it's maybe the same SOC but different boards, same bootloader, but they always lose, uh, very often lose out on handling the variants in the bootloader. They do it correctly for Linux, they choose a good device tree for Linux that has everything described, but not for the bootloader, and that way you lose out on stuff like USB recovery, because USB, here you have an USB-C with a Type-C controller, here you have like a USB OTG port, and on that other hardware you have a switch and no Ethernet, and then you have like the strip down bootloader that while it can start on all hardware, you can do network boot with it. And it's always a pain to develop with it stuff. And you always need to like hack stuff in. So it's nice that when you know what kind of hardware you are and what differences this hardware has, that you also patch the uh, device tree of the bootloader. Uh, the very easy way to do that is just use a different device tree for the bootloader. So in Bearbox, you can just compile all device trees that you want via uh, kconfig, they are enabled. And then you have symbols that you can reference or not. If you don't reference them, they are discarded. But if you reference them, you can choose normally in C code. If I have that, use that device tree. If I don't, use that device tree and pass it to your entry function. You can have something similar with uBoot, where uBoot boots a fit image that contains the later stages and can have multiple device trees. It can choose the correct device tree from that. Uh, but what you can also do in Bearbox that's not easily use, uh, doable in U-Boot is to apply fix-ups and overlays to Bearbox own device tree because that's always a live device tree. You can just dynamically fix it up. Uh, we have seen this example with using OF register fix-up to apply a fix uh, to register a fix-up for the kernel device tree. You could you can just call this fix-up callback directly on your own device tree and manipulate it and then, for example, adds the nodes that describe your switch or something. And overlays can also be just compiled into Bearbox and applied onto its own device tree. And recently this year, this has also been some work to make it more dynamic. So you could actually probe an I2C EEPROM, find out what bot you have, apply an overlay, and use an I2C device that was on the same bus as the EEPROM that you had. So these are the kind of corner cases when you try to patch a live uh, device tree. But yeah, a lot of that is handled in Bearbox now. So if you are early enough, which you are when you are here in ACME Probe, which is like the driver for your board, which is the first driver that's probed, then you can say, yeah, uh, probe me that EEPROM, read it out, and then patch the device tree very early on before the other drivers had a chance to run. Yeah, that concludes what I wanted to talk about. So in summary, the bootloader should probe what uh, board type it has, or it should just be configured to be, a, uh, should have just compiled in which board type it is. Then it fixes up the kernel device tree and possibly the bootloader's own device tree. Linux will get a device tree that will make it uh, oblivious, or not oblivious, but doesn't uh, it doesn't have to handle the variants itself. For it, it's just a device tree for exactly the hardware that it has. And then user software needs to select configuration dynamically. And yeah, beware of hard-coded numbers. So if you see, uh, see GPIO, SysFS indices, IRQ numbers, disk order, no, don't do that. Use something like libgpio.d, uh, which, um, yeah, which was talked about. Uh, yeah, what of caution with... Uh, libgpio.d, a lot of people just change set value for sysfs with gpio set. That's not portable. You are not guaranteed what state a gpio has after gpio set returns. So write your own daemon or contribute to systemd gpio.d, which I hope we will have someday. Uh, and yeah, that's it. And best case, you do it very early 
So you'd have less work when you add your second platform. So yeah, questions? Are you convinced you are going to use it? <laughs> oh. so, so we actually have a bunch of boards in the same family, and then like the bootloaders are the same. But like, whoops, did somebody say something? Oh, Could you speak uh, a bit louder. Oh, okay. Sorry. Is it better now? Okay, so so we actually have a bunch of boards in the same family that have um, slight variations in U-boot, but the problem is, um, um, like they all have the same DTSI, right? And then and then for the family, and then eventually for the board. So, what is is there a plan to formalize like a process to just build the DTSI and then include all the um, specific boards that you want in one config because using multiple configs like like you're using one single config to target multiple boards right yeah so uh, uh -huh. i didn't get that last question but i got the one before that <laughs> could you repeat yeah. the last sentence so it's like you're talking about multiple board support on one bootloader yeah all right so do you use one config for like in uboot uh, to target uh, yeah, so uh -huh. if it's like uh, in the IMX8MM projects I had, it was one config. And uh, in that one config, I just try to target in the device tree the common subset of them. And then at a later stage, you do the dynamic stuff. So you target a common subset uh -huh. to be able to read an EEPROM, for example, and then you patch the device tree. But the problem with patching the device tree in U-Boot, mm -hmm. it doesn't really work well. Okay, so you just pick the fit, uh, pick the device tree overlay out of the fit based on... I'm not sure you can do that with U-Boot. So that's what I did in the same project yeah. with Bearbox. Just have uh, multiple overlays. I have uh, subsets that can read the EEPROM. Then uh -huh. I have multiple overlays. I apply the overlay. And then the bootloader looks as if it were really compiled just for this board. On the U-Boot side, we had some board code to try to like initialize the USB that's different from board to board. But it, it was quite a bit of a mess. It was also because it was a legacy platform, you could clean up the U-boot code there for sure, but it doesn't really make it easy because it's pretty much uh, compile time configuration what you want to support. You see that with all the weak functions where you can employ, um, implement board specific stuff. If that changes between two boards, you need to implement another weak function and either call that or either call that. Y yeah, yeah. okay. Just one remark, do it even if you have one board, because your hardware engineer will just do variants later. Yeah, exactly. They do use cut and paste heavily. Yeah, exactly. We had instances where you don't do this from the beginning, and then you have something like, yeah, we have like 20 boards, throw them away, it's not worth the hassle to support them, because you need to do changes all over the place, so yeah, just don't boot old boards which is kind of a shame because these spots are the ones you have plentiful and you can put into your automated testing. But yeah, you have to throw them away because you can't support them. Or they're a bit rot. And yes, remember to tell your hardware engineers to have resistors to make the boards uh, identifiable from your bootloader. It makes your life easier. Exactly. Or at least have an EEPROM that's always at the same location, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmad.